Peter began his first epistle by saying, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And then he says, and we thank him for our blessed hope. And I'm grateful for that blessed hope, aren't you? Thank the Lord for that hope we have in Jesus Christ. I want to ask you to pray with me uh, about a special request this morning. I believe when God's people pray, uh, he, he moves. And um, we have a friend who was on a cruise and had uh, serious, serious heart issues in Cozumel. And they need to fly her out of there back to the States. And they've been overnight without being able to get a flight. And it is critical that they get a flight and get back to Memphis. So would you just join me right now just for a moment of prayer? And we'll pray for this service too. Father, I thank you that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are in our midst. And Lord, we thank you that when we agree on anything as touching anything that touches your heart, then Lord, we can expect an, uh, an answer. And we know you, you hear and answer our prayers. And Lord, I, I pray for my friend today. I pray for her family as they anxiously await a flight out of Cozumel. And Lord, I pray if it would be your providential will that you would uh, provide that flight, not just back to the States, but back here to, to Memphis, back to her home, back to her doctors. And Lord, we'll give you praise for that. We pray the peace of God would rest upon the family today. Now, Lord, we just focus on this moment in time. We pray that thanking you that you are here with us. We don't have to beg you to come. You delight in being here. And I pray that because you are here, uh, this service has incredible potential to change lives, to change eternal destinies even today. And so, Lord, we pray that would happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I want to preach to you today on the subject, staying faithful when you want to quit. Staying faithful when you want to quit. And the text is Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every <clears throat> encumbrance <clears throat> and the sin which so easily entangles us. <clears throat> and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. A week ago this past Friday night, I really sat spellbound as Chad Williams, former Navy SEAL, shared his own personal testimony as to the power of Christ to change his life. How that when he became a SEAL and he got that coveted pin that all SEAL members wear, he thought he had attained the apex, the epitome of life. But he found an emptiness an emptiness that said, is this all there is? But in the process of sharing his testimony, he walked us through what is commonly called, quote, unquote, hell week. It is that last week of training for SEALs. It is an amazing test of endurance. Beginning that training was a hundred and 73 men, finishing Hell Week, receiving the pen, there were 13 men. All those weeks of intensive, exhausting training. Chad said, I kept saying to myself, don't quit. Don't quit. Keep going. 
Have you ever been that way in your walk with Christ? Has there ever been situations and circumstances that have crowded in on you? Has there ever been that perfect storm that has caused you to say, Lord, I don't know, is it worth it to keep going? I've been thinking about this because I've been asked to preach tomorrow to the pastors in the Mid-South Baptist Association on finishing well. And that's a desire of mine, and as I believe, it's a desire of all of us. But I've been doing this long enough to observe some of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Brother Larry, some pastors, some staff members, some deacons, some Sunday school teachers and leaders in our churches who lived just a few years too long. You say, well, why do you say that? Because they lived long enough to not finish well. Like Solomon and many other Bible characters, they began well. They showed so much promise, but somewhere in their middle to late years, they undid all of the good that they had done. In the words of radio preacher Steve Brown, they didn't get home before dark. The New Testament teaches that Paul did get home before dark, that Paul endured to the end, and he finished faithful with his being, his head being severed in, a, in Rome. But he stayed faithful. He said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course, and I have kept the faith. But if you read in that last letter and in those last few words, of the Apostle Paul, the last written words of the Apostle Paul, he says of his friend Demas, but Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. And what makes that so sad is that Demas had an impeccable track record. In other verses, like Philemon 24, he's called my faithful servant. My, he was a man Paul trusted, but he didn't finish well. I know this, my precious friend, that one minute out of the will of God, and I could blow a half a century of ministry. It is crucial, it is critical for all of us to finish well. I think it would be accurate to say that that's probably the desire of every one of us. I've never run into anyone who just said, well, preacher, I really would like to blow it before I die. I don't think that's in anybody's heart. I remember as a young, eager preacher uh, hanging over the balcony of First Baptist Church, Jackson, Mississippi, at my first Mississippi Baptist Convention. I thought I had arrived in heaven. And I was listening to who at that time was one of the most powerful preachers in our convention, Dr. John Bazzano, pastor of the great First Baptist Church in Houston. I hung on every word he preached. I can remember Dr. Bazzano stating that when he started in the ministry, there were 24 of his contemporaries, his friends, who had been called of God into the ministry. They studied together. They grew up together. They entered the ministry together. He said, I wrote all 24 names in the back of my Bible. He said, we were in our 20s then. But then he went on to say, but years later, from time to time as the years went by, I had to turn to the back of my Bible and cross out a name. 33 years later, Dr. Bazzano said, there were only three names remaining on the original 24. As a young pastor, that jarred me. There are many analogies in the New Testament as to what the Christian 
life is like. It's like a vine abiding in the branch. It's like enlisting in God's army. And on and on we could go looking for metaphors that describe that relationship. But one of the most powerful and challenging metaphors in the Scripture concerning what the Christian life is like, it's like a long-distance race. And that's the one that the writer of Hebrews is bringing to our attention today. He's saying that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And of course, that refers back to all of the saints in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we call that chapter the chapter of the heroes of faith. And, and one after another, he talks about those characters who overcame circumstance and situation and difficulties through faith. By faith, Abraham, by faith, and on and on and on he goes. And then he says, now we're surrounded by those people. He said, and having been surrounded by them, let us run with patience the race. Now that lets us know it's not a sprint, right? You don't run a sprint with patience, <laughs> But we Baptists are great sprinters. Could I have an amen? You, you, we're great sprinters. We come out of the block with a lot of enthusiasm and zeal and energy. But we're like, well, I don't want to draw the analogy too closely. I started to say, we're like my friend's quarter horse. I, I, that doesn't sound too good. But anyway, uh, you'll get the illustration. I, I had a friend we grew up together. We used to ride in the rodeos. You, believe it or not, I, I was in the Junior Brahma bull riding. Now, can you picture that? I was skinny and I had long enough legs I could wrap them around the little Brahma bull and hang on. But, I, but my friend had a quarter horse named Buck. And we grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, and, and Buck was the fastest horse in Lee County. No other horse in the county could come close. And so we began to think as young teenagers, we have stumbled upon an aberration. We've stumbled upon the fastest horse in the world. Now, how do you determine if Buck is the fastest horse in the world? Well, you have to put him up against other fast horses. Now, please don't go out of here saying, Brother Tom is for horse racing. I'm just telling you a story. This is my B.C. days before Christ. And so we took Buck to a place where there were thoroughbred horse racing, and we entered Buck into the one-mile race. Did you hear me say one-mile race? Did you hear me say a while ago that Buck was a quarter horse? Well, we're not too smart, but when the gate came up and the horses came out, Buck was way out in front of all the other horses. And we thought our suspicions were confirmed. Buck is faster than any horse in the world. Until he got to the first turn in that mile track. And in spite of everything my friend could do, Buck veered off the track and down into the pasture. <laughs> and the, quarter, the, 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 the thoroughbreds just kept going. And they looked over at him and smiled. <laughs> Quarter horses can't talk, but they can get a smug on their face. It was like they were thinking, you can't stand the distance, can you, buddy? We discovered that day that quarter horse was born and bred for the sprint. He didn't have the heart of a long-distance horse. He didn't have the will. He didn't have the desire. It was the way he was born that made him that way. Now, again, don't press this analogy too far. But if you're a child of God today in this room or watching by means of live stream or whatever, when you were saved, God put the heart of a champion in you. God put the heart of a long distance Christian in you. God gave you all the resources you need to finish the race and to finish it well. 
Now you say, well, preacher, how do we do that? How do we keep going like Chad Williams when you're out there in that cold ocean and, and you just can't go another second, but you keep doing it anyway? How do you keep going? Well, the text here tells us how to keep going. Uh, let me just share some principles with you for, for just to keep going, to not quit, to stay in the race. The, the first thing I would say to you is this. If we're going to finish the race well, we must listen to the right people. We must listen to the right people. You say, well, how do you get that? Well, look at the text. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of, what's that next word, church? Witnesses. That's the word for we get our English word martyr. And it refers back to those martyrs in chapter 11. We're surrounded by people who loved God enough that they were willing to go to their grave in following him. Now, we're surrounded by them, by those martyrions. We're surrounded by witnesses. Now, a witness does one of two things, or both. A witness sees something, or a witness says something, or both. Well, in the case of the text here, the focus is really not on what the witness sees, but on what the witness says. Because I, I can't prove by this verse that the people who've gone on to heaven are looking over the banisters and watching what we're doing. I can't disprove it, but I can't prove it. I can't use this verse to prove that. But here's what I can say. This verse is saying that those witnesses, those martyrs back in chapter 11, are speaking to us. It's like they are shouting out at us. They're in the stands, and they're saying, Tommy, we made it. We made it. And if we made it, you can make it. And what that means is this. They are encouraging us by what they say to us. And I just want to say to you, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because who speaks in your life influences your life. Who we give our ear to will make a difference in our life. If I'm going to run the race successfully, I've got to tune my spiritual ears to those who will help me, not those who will hurt me. I need to listen to committed, spirit-filled believers who can counsel me in the right way. And can I say, the worst thing a Christian can do is take advice from another carnal Christian. If you want people to speak life into your life, hang with people who are alive. Max Lucado, man, I don't always agree with, so I'm not putting a blank statement on, on him, but he has something good to say here. In his book, The Eye of the Storm, he has a chapter entitled Fending Off the Voices. Amazing. And he's, he's, when he writes this, he's in a hotel room up in the northwestern part of our country. And listen to what he says. I don't want to bore you, but he says it better than Tommy Vincent can. He says uh, this. He says, as I work on this manuscript, I'm seated at a desk in a hotel room. I'm far away from home. That means his wife and his daughters. He said, I'm away from people who know me, from family members who love me. Voices that encourage and affirm me are distant, he says. But voices that tantalize and entice are very near. Although the room is quiet, if I listen, their voices are crystal clear. A, play car, a placard on my nightstand invites me to a lounge in the lobby where I can, quote, make new friends in a relaxing atmosphere. An advertisement on the top of the television promises me that with the request of a late night adult movie, my fantasies will come true. In the phone book, several columns of escort services offer love away from home. Now get this, an attractive gold-lettered volume in the drawer of the nightstand beckons the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. On television, a talk show host discusses the topic of the day, how to succeed at sex 
in the office. Voices. Some for pleasure, some for power, all these voices promising something. Voices. Excuse me just a moment. Honey, would you come get this watch? It's driving me nuts. It keeps ringing. You can't hear it, but I can. Okay, would you come get it? I don't know why it won't stop. See if there's somebody that needs me real bad. I'm sorry, folks. I, I, I thought it would quit in a minute, but it didn't. Now, where was I before I so rudely interrupted myself here? Voices. Voices, that's right. But then Lucato tells us that it took a few minutes to find it, but I did. It wasn't as visible as the lounge play card or the movie advertisement, but it was there. It wasn't as fancy as the Book of Mormon or the attention-grabbing as the escort ads, but I'd give up those lies every time for the peace I found in this treasure. Lucado's ministry hung on the voice he listened to that day. The voice enticing him to be unfaithful to his wife and daughters. The voice to follow a track of heresy and wrong theology or the old Gideon Bible that led him down the path to Jesus Christ. There are voices all around us that are crying out to us. Your finishing the race will depend to a great extent on the voices you listen to. I must listen to the right people. Here's the second thing, number two. Not only must I listen to the right people, but secondly, I must lay aside the weights. See what he says? We, we must lay aside the weights. William Barclay has a great statement here. He said, if I'm to travel far, I must travel light. Isn't that good? If I'm going to travel far, I must travel light. Now, there are two sources of weights that we have to face. The first one is circumstances and, uh, and people. <laughs> weights come from circumstances and people. Uh, for example, from circumstances comes the weight of discouragement. Have you ever been involved in a set of circumstances, maybe you're there today, that are discouraging? This kind of takes all the courage out of you, just kind of leaves you breathless. Life can do that sometimes. It gets very complicated. It seems that it makes no sense. We know Romans 8, 28, as Ron said, is his favorite verse, that God works all things together for good. We know that is in the Bible, but it's hard to trace God's activity in our present circumstances. And if we're not careful, circumstances can cause us to stop running the race. Chuck Swindoll was right. He said, when we signed up for this Christian race, we didn't walk onto a playground, but onto a battlefield. The second source of, uh, that, that comes to weight us down is people. And from people come the, comes the weight of disappointment. Circumstances discourage us. People disappoint us. I think Paul was feeling that weight in 2 Timothy 4 when he made those statements, Demas hath forsaken me. He was feeling that heaviness that his friends were leaving. And disappointment comes to all of us. It comes to all of us who are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. People will disappoint us. We can disappoint ourselves. And if we're going to finish well, we have to learn not to let the weights of discouragement and disappointment knock us out of the race. That's why Jesus said this, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see what this is saying is, it's not enough just to ask the question, is it a sin? 
We need to ask a second question, deeper question. Not just is it a sin, but does it rob me of something better that God has for me? Does it, does it keep my appetite from intimacy with God at bay? It, does it keep my prayer life from being what it ought to be? It may not be evil. It may not be bad. It may be that I'm spending too many hours on social media and not enough hours in the Word of God. And I pause for emphasis. Isn't that true? There's nothing evil about it. But it is if it robs us of time alone with God. If it robs us from intimacy with the Lord, it may not be evil, but it may rob us of God's best. So we got to lay aside the weights. Lay aside. If I'm running a race and you tie five pounds of gold around each of my ankles, that's going to slow me down. What if you tie five pounds of lead around my ankles? It's going to slow me down. You see, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if that weight is made of gold or made of lead. It may be something beautiful and wonderful, but if it keeps you from God's best, it's no better than lead. Lay aside the weights. Okay, let me, let me move on. Thirdly. Here's the third principle. We must, we must leave behind the wickedness. You notice what he says? Lay aside the ways and what church? The sin. The sin. You see, weights will trip you up. Sin will knock you down. Weights slow you down. Sin puts you out of the race. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about it puts you out of, 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 of this growing in Christ. It puts you out of intimacy with Christ. It puts you out and causes you to miss out on all that God wants to do in your life. We need to treat sin radically. That's what I'm trying to say. We need to treat sin radically. Jesus put it this way. If your eye offends you, what? Pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. What's he saying? He's, obviously that's hyperbole. Jesus is not going around encouraging people to pull out their eye and chop off their hand. He's, he's using it hyperbolically to say, treat sin radically. I, I just finished reading again a very wonderful little book. This, I, I recommend it to you. Um, I met Don Whitney many, many years ago. He's a professor at Southern Seminary, great, great guy. He teaches on the disciplines of the Christian life. He's got a little book out entitled Simplify Your Spiritual Life. It's a, good, it's a good little book. He has one chapter in there, very short, entitled Kill Your Sins. And it's about the doctrine of mortification, of, of, of killing, dying to self and sin. He uses two contrastive illustrations. They're both real brief. I want to read these two little paragraphs to you. He says, in April 1983, Robert Verling of Westminster, Missouri, was found on his bed, crushed to death by his 16-foot, 100-pound pet Burmese python. Verling's wife said that he had complete trust in the snake and often played with it on the bed. Each of us lives with many unseen snakes, all more deadly than a Burmese python. Now, obviously, the point is, don't play with the snake. <laughs> now, I don't mean to offend any of you snake lovers out there, but he's saying, I don't care how friendly you get, don't turn your back on it. 
And then he contrasts that with this story. January 2001, Reuters News Network reported the death of a South African, uh, reported the attack of a South African named Lucas Sabinda, who was attacked by a python trapped in the snake's constricting coil. Sabinda bit the reptile in the head, kicked it and punched it until it released him. Then he picked up a stick and killed it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. How are we to treat the snakes of sin? How are we to treat the wickedness? He said, lay aside every weight and the sin. It means, my precious brother, if you're flirting with pornography, it'll kill you. I'm not trying to preach at you. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I, I, want, I love you. I want to help you. I don't want your family to fall apart. I've seen too much of that in 50 years. Young teenager, if you're flirting with, with drugs, I'm just saying for, for God's sake in your life, recognize that it's like that python. It'll get you in its grips. It'll get you in its calls, and it'll destroy you. Fight it with everything you've got. Pick up the stick of kindness and knock the daylights out of it. Well, lay aside the weights. Leave behind the wicked. I, I, I've got two more. I'm just going to mention them. I, uh, lay aside the weights. Leave behind the wickedness. Look for the weariness. Do you see verse 3? Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. My brother and sister, if the, if the devil can't get you out of the race through wickedness, he just as soon gets you out of the race through weakness and worry and all sorts of, of, of uh, stuff that he allows to come into your life to distract you. Look for the weariness. In World War II, there was a poem written in a foxhole. Some go down in shrapnel. Some go down in flames. Most men die inch by inch and play at little things. If we're not careful, we'll let the little things, the little things that we allow to come into our life, and, and, and the weaknesses uh, that come into our life. We must not only leave the wickedness, but we must look for the weariness. When did the Lord Jesus face the greatest temptation? After he had fasted for 40 days and he was weak. Well, let me close. This is my last one. If I'm going to keep going when everything within me wants to say, quit if I'm going to finish the race. Here's the last and more, most important thing. If you don't hear anything else I say, hear this one. You've got to look away to Jesus. Here's another way of saying, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Looking to Jesus, the author and finish. That literally means this, looking away to Jesus. Some of the translations put it that way. And the point is, looking away from all of those great heroes in chapter 11. You see, if I look at other people, one or two things are going to happen. They're going to be so far ahead of me spiritually, I'm going to get discouraged and say, I could never be as great as they are. Or I'm going to be a little bit in front of them and I'm going to look back and say, man, I'm doing great. Either way, the devil's got us. You see, we can't look at ourselves. We can't look at others. We need to look. Jesus. My precious friend Mike Brzezinski, who was in Vietnam, jumping out of a helicopter one night, he had been trained that whatever his squad leader did, he was to do. If his squad leader pulled left, he went left. If he pulled right, he went right. Without thought, instant obedience. They exited the helicopter. He watched his squad leader as he took a, a, a very quick drastic move 
to the left. Mike followed him instinctively. And as he looked down, he saw the blades of a helicopter. Had he not followed his leader, had he not kept his eyes on the commander, he would have been consumed in the blades of that helicopter. It is important, dear friend, that you keep your eyes on Jesus. Would you bow your head with me just for a moment? I want to just take a moment and talk to you about this. If you've never entered the race, you can't finish the race. You've got to make sure that you're in the race. And how do we get in the race? By repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He's already paid the entry fee through his shed blood. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to earn that place in the race. It's a gift. But you've got to be willing to repent of your sin and put your faith in Christ. It's really as simple as ABC. We've got to admit that we are a sinner in need of a Savior. Is that where you are today? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then after we admit that we're a sinner, we have to believe that, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to come into this world and to live for 33 years without sin, then die on that cross for your sins and mine. We've got to believe that Jesus Christ was willing to die on the cross, take your sins and mine in his body and pay the penalty of death for your sins and mine, which he did. But death couldn't hold him. He rose from the dead. We sung about that this morning. Jesus is alive. And he says, if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved too. And that's where the C comes in, in the ABCs. Will you confess him? Will you confess him as your Lord and Savior? In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. One of the ways you can confess him is by stepping out of the aisle and coming and saying to one of the counselors, today I want to confess Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that he died for me and rose again. I want him to forgive me. I repent of my sins. I confess him today publicly as my Savior and Lord. Now I want to pray for you, and then we're going to sing the invitation. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, it's the prayer I think of, I know of me and the staff and every Christian in this room that this might be the day when you'd open your heart to Christ. If you're here today and you've never you've never done that we want to help you to do it today. So as we stand and we start to sing I was going to ask you just to come and say to one of the counselors you know today I want to confess Christ as my Savior. They'll help you from there. You may be here and you're looking for a church home. We invite you. Come and put your membership in Germantown Baptist Church. Father, in these moments of invitation, we're praying, Lord, that you would save someone, that you would draw someone to yourself by your Holy Spirit. You'd let them know so strongly that you love them and that you want them to be saved today. I pray for that person, Lord, who's struggling in the race and they're about to give up. Lord, today I pray that this message would help them, Lord, to come back. Lord, to listen to the right people, to lay aside the weights, to leave behind that wickedness, to, lead, to, to know that that weariness is there from the enemy to try to put them out of the race. But Lord, most of all, help them to look to Jesus. Keep their eyes on Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing this invitation. If you need to come to the altar for prayer, please do so while we sing.